Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate your patience. Uh, patience. We're a bu busy day, as uh, almost every day is here at the White House. Uh, before I get to your questions, I had a couple of things I wanted to uh, say to you. And uh, the first is that uh, in front of you and to my left here uh, is Peggy Suntum, who 30 years ago got a phone call. Uh, she was set to begin a new job the following day as a White House stenographer, meticulously transcribing the President's every public utterance. I'm reading from a Zeke Miller story published today in, on Time Magazine's website. The caller informed her that the Marine barracks in Beirut had been attacked and that she was needed immediately. Since then, Peggy, who is a master stenographer and a wonderful person and a friend to many of you, has been uh, recording the words of uh, five different Presidents. and. Uh, unfortunately for her on occasion, press secretaries. But uh, I just wanted to congratulate her on her 30 years and uh, thank her for her service. I also have uh, an announcement that on Wednesday, November 20th, President Barack Obama will award the Presidential Medal of Freedom. The Medal of Freedom is our nation's highest civilian honor, presented to individuals who have made especially meritorious contributions to the security or national interests of the United States, to world peace, or to cultural or other significant public or private endeavors. Additional details about the event, including media logistics, will be released at a later date. As you know, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the executive order signed by President John F. Kennedy establishing the Presidential Medal of Freedom, as well as the first ceremony bestowing the honor on an inaugural class of 31 recipients. Since that time, more than 500 exceptional individuals from all corners of society have been awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And with that, Take a few questions. We, I think it's out there who the recipients are. There's, there, 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 are, there are, yes, yes. Uh, I have to say it was a distinct uh, uh, pleasure for me to speak with Ben Bradley about the fact that he'll be receiving one this year. Um, Jim. Thanks, Jay. Uh, on health care, uh, Secretary Sebelius on CNN yesterday said that the, the President was not aware of any of the uh, uh, the problems with the healthcare.gov website before it launched. Um, and we've come to find out since then that there were a bunch of red flags that had cropped up before before launch. And so I'm wondering whether the President feels now that he should have been made aware of that. Uh, should somebody be held accountable for giving him that information? And if there was somebody giving him information, was he in fact misinformed about the status of the, of the launch? Jim, thank you for that question. Secretary Sebelius was uh, referring to what I have said and what the President himself has said, which is that uh, while we knew that there would be some glitches and actually said publicly uh, that we expected some problems, we did not know uh, until the problems manifested themselves uh, after the launch that they would be as significant as they have turned out to be. Uh, so. You know, there was testing and there were some uh, problems anticipated, but we did not expect, and by we I mean broadly, the administration did not expect uh, the, uh, the scale of uh, problems that we have seen, which is why at the President's direction uh, and the Secretary's direction, we have uh, launched this all-out effort 24-7 uh, with a tech surge of experts, new eyes and ears coming in to, to assist the existing team. Uh, to identify and isolate uh, each problem uh, that uh, exists with the functionality of the website, uh, assess what the best solutions are to uh, creating a remedy for that specific problem, and then applying it, whether it's uh, increasing server capacity or uh, writing new code to work around uh, a situation, providing greater uh, accessibility for uh, improvements in the user interface. Uh, you know, these are all things that the teams uh, currently operating and, and working on making improvements to the system are focusing on. And they're, uh, they're, 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 they're tackling the problems one by one, uh, they're prioritizing them, and they're addressing them. These are, these are technical, logistical problems that uh, require the kind of expertise that's being brought to bear to fix them. 
but there is no question that we did not anticipate the scale of the problems with the website. What is also important to remember is that the website is not the Affordable Care Act. What has been in place since October 1st uh, and what will be in place for the millions of consumers who want the product is the vast array of affordable health plans uh, out there because of the marketplaces set up by the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and every day, more and more Americans are uh, submitting applications, they're enrolling, they're shopping, and they're finding out that they have access to affordable health insurance. And if they're uh, among the 15 to 20 percent of the uh, American people who uh, did not have insurance in the past, they're discovering that uh, they have options available to them uh, that make it affordable and that will provide them, come January 1st, uh, security that they've lacked in the past. And while uh, the struggles that individuals have had with the website are extremely unfortunate and uh, we take responsibility for them and we are uh, working around the clock to fix the website to make that experience easier. Uh, those struggles, as I said yesterday, pale in comparison to the uh, uncertainty that a single mom who's a breast cancer survivor has felt every day that she's lacked insurance uh, because she can't afford it. She's been priced out of it or insurers simply won't give it to her because she has a pre-existing condition and that is why uh, we have to keep focused on the, uh, the end goal here, which is making this insurance available to millions of Americans who need it. These, these struggles, as you say, Jay, um, are also, however, having a political impact. And today, the administration briefed uh, a bunch of Democrats in the House. And as they came out, you could see clearly sense the, the frustration that they were having. They were calling for accountability. They were demanding action. They were demanding more answers. And I'm wondering, these are, these are your allies, these mm -hmm. are people who you are asking to be out there supporting the, the health care plan. What is the price that, that, uh, that they might have to pay? And what is it that you can do to satisfy their demands for accountability, for answers? Well, we're working every day around the clock, uh, the, the, the teams specifically, the tech teams uh, on the website problems to ensure that the experience is better so that those questions are answered and that the constituents of those lawmakers uh, are given the services that uh, they deserve and that they have earned through the Affordable Care Act. Uh, so uh, the frustration that lawmakers who supported the Affordable Care Act feel uh, over the fact that a portion of it is uh, not functioning at, at the level we want it to function is, is, is frustration shared first and foremost by the President and by all of us. And uh, that's why we're, we're crashing on these problems and uh, applying a, a high level of expertise and experience to fixing them. The, the politics of this, I promise you, uh, are not the focus of the White House or the administration, and I don't think they're the focus of uh, those on Capitol Hill who have long supported uh, providing access to affordable health insurance to millions of Americans who didn't have it in the past. Their focus is on making that goal come true. Uh, and uh, we're working with them and we're going to brief them. We're going to keep everybody updated. Uh, we're going to uh, provide as much information as we can uh, on the work that's being done. Uh, I can tell you that uh, beginning tomorrow uh, at the direction of Secretary Sebelius, there'll be daily briefings at CMS to update uh, individuals, uh, reporters who are interested on uh, the progress that's being made and uh, the efforts that are being undertaken both to address the technical problems and to uh, make the whole experience for American consumers better. Uh, and, and that includes making Americans aware of the fact that there are four ways to uh, enroll uh, in, the, uh, in the exchanges, and that includes not just online but by phone or uh, at in-person uh, 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 centers in uh, hospitals or uh, local health centers. Uh, or by mail. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going to work every day to make this experience better, to make sure that it's providing the benefits that uh, the Affordable Care Act uh, promises and will deliver, uh, and to make sure that uh, we can inform you as best as we can about the process that we're undertaking. Uh, one last question I wanted to ask about uh, a personnel matter involving the NSC that emerged today. And wondered, does, 
does the White House investigate all anonymous Twitter accounts that are critical of the administration? You know, I do not have uh, any information on personnel matters. I can tell you that the individual does not work here uh, anymore. He was an employee of the State Department uh, on temporary duty here. Uh, but I would refer you to him. Uh, I, you know, I just don't have anything on it for you. I mean, there are obviously codes of conduct uh, in general, in, uh, but it, this on specific instances or even a broad question like that, I just I don't have anything for you. Yeah. Um, on the Affordable Care Act rollout, Senator Shaheen, a Democrat, has said that uh, many of her constituents are frustrated in enrolling and has uh, asked that the President consider a delay in the sign-up period. Is that something the President would consider or is considering? Uh, Mark, what I can tell you is that today Americans have access to affordable coverage. Today. And that was true on October 1st. Uh, they can enroll in four ways, as I just mentioned to Jim. Uh, and we are working on the problems that are real and significant and unacceptable that exist in one of those avenues to enrolling on the website. We are still in the early stages of the open enrollment period. We are in, uh, we are at what, three weeks and two days into this process. So uh, we remain focused on making improvements to one of the avenues through which you can enroll, individuals can enroll, and in making uh, uh, Americans aware of the other uh, access points available to them and, and making those uh, more effective by increasing staff uh, at the call centers, for example, in peak times or um, you know, making the changes to the home page of the uh, uh, healthcare.gov site uh, clearer so that those who visit it know uh, that those other avenues are available to them, that they can uh, compare plans and get you know, some estimates about uh, what insurance might be available to them at what rough cost, but then if they want to get more information and uh, more and specifically to enroll, they can and don't want to do it through the website or are having trouble through the website. They have these other avenues available to them, and we're gonna we're gonna you know tackle this problem every day. You know we're gonna run this play and we're gonna get three yards, and we're gonna keep running it and we're gonna keep making progress. And uh, the important thing is that that the insurance that is the core of this program is made available at affordable prices to millions of Americans who didn't have it. And, you know, I think uh, we're not making excuses for the serious problems that consumers have encountered on the website, but, uh, you know, an element of this is the enormous demand that's out there. And, you know, we, we had high expectations for interest levels, but we, uh, uh, we did not expect what we saw and, and what we have seen. And, uh, you know, that's a that's a challenge to us uh, to make this law work for those people who want it to work for them. And that has nothing to do with politics. That has to do with the security of families across the country. Uh, you know, the, there are a lot of stories, and I think you've seen them in the press, of people who have gotten through, have enrolled, or have shopped and simply made themselves aware of the fact that, uh, you know, their lives are going to change fundamentally for the better on January 1st because they're going to have affordable health insurance that they did not have before or because they had a pre-existing condition that priced them out of the insurance market entirely. And, uh, you know, it's hard to uh, measure the importance of that in, in the lives of individuals across the country. International question. Sure. Um, you uh, addressed yesterday questions about a possible rift with Saudi Arabia over that country's concerns about U.S. policies uh, towards Iran and Syria. I'm just wondering whether you have learned about those concerns through anything other than press reports, whether the government there has oh. expressed those to you directly. No, I and think I said yesterday that Secretary Kerry had been uh, meeting with in Paris his uh, Saudi counterpart, and, and we obviously have an, a very close working relationship with Saudi Arabia have had for a long time. We have uh, an enormous amount of important uh, business that we do on a bilateral basis with Saudi Arabia, and that is a relationship of uh, both friendship and res respect. It, obviously, we have disagreements uh, on some issues, uh, and we work those out in a candid and forthright way uh, as we maintain the, you know, the, the basic foundation of a very important relationship. And, Secretary Kerry addressed this, I think, at, at length when he took some questions uh, in the aftermath of those meetings. Uh, and so we're going to keep, uh, keep working with uh, our Saudi partners because that relationship is very important uh, 
economically uh, and uh, in national security ways. And then lastly, on the, the Twitter issue, mm -hmm. uh, without asking you to address any specific personnel matters, uh, does the White House, as a result of this, take any additional procedures to ensure the security or the integrity of tweets put out by employees of uh, well, let, let, the executive branch? Well, on that point, I think it's important to know that, that you know, unless you have uh, uh, an authorized official Twitter account or social media account, as some of us do, you, 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 White House employees are not able to access social media sites like that uh, for, uh, at all, or f obviously for personal use. So, you know, I have at PressSec, Josh and others, Jamie have official Twitter accounts, but uh, there, you, you can't go on Twitter and uh, sign up for uh, an account unless it's authorized. Yeah. Thanks, through, through, through White House equipment. Um, can we talk to some computer experts because you suggested that we should? Um, one, Dave Kennedy is the CEO of a leading information security company, estimates that about 20% of healthcare.gov needs to be re rewritten, estimating that to be about 100 million lines of code, and suggesting that fixing the site could take six months to a year. Does that sort of, is that what you're hearing? Uh, uh, thank you for the question. I, I can tell you that the way we're, well, what I would refrain from doing is, you know, making estimates based on, uh, you know, what you're reading in the press and focus instead, as our tech experts are, uh, on the specific identified problems that they've found and the fixes that they're working on applying. Uh, you know, our approach is to look head on at the problems and uh, try to fix them every day knowing that this is going to be uh, a constant effort and that each day we're going to make some progress and each day there'll be an improvement to the user experience on healthcare.gov uh, and each day we will work through a variety of means to provide information to Americans about the other avenues they can use to uh, get information and enroll uh, in an insurance plan so uh, we're, like what we're not getting specific Mm -hmm. from your text about what the problems are. Mm -hmm. You told us to talk to computer experts, so that's what we're doing. Sure, no, I, I look, mean, I think it, that's, a, it, that's a smart thing to do. Is that unrealistic? Because if you're talking six months to a year, obviously that's going to affect the mandate, I would imagine. Uh, again, from day one, people have been able to enroll. From day one. So, and that includes on healthcare.gov. Uh, as we've... Uh, you know, surged resources and brain power uh, towards uh, fixing the problems that, uh, can I just finish, that arose, uh, the experience on healthcare.gov healthcare has incrementally improved, and I think that has been uh, acknowledged. Uh, so from day one, people have been able to use the site. Uh, the experience has been unacceptably uh, problematic. Uh, we are making changes every day and improvements every day to improve that experience so that more and more people can use it effectively. We're also making it clear that there are other ways to enroll because if the Affordable Care Act is not a website. It is not like, you know, creating perfection on a website would not deliver what the Affordable Care Act promises. What the Affordable Care Act promises is a marketplace uh, for insurance products uh, that provide that insurance affordably to millions of Americans across the country who cannot get it otherwise. So. Obviously, an mm -hmm. issue, as you've acknowledged, that the website isn't up. I'm just wondering. I look at this six months to a year. That's a really long time. Is that well, yeah, out of I the would, realm I, of possibility? Again, I don't. I, what an outside computer expert might guesstimate about uh, what the end of a process would look like is obviously based on a lot of assumptions, and I'm not judging it beyond saying that uh, what we're doing is focusing on specific problems, isolating problems, for example, with. Uh, you know, signing up, isolating problems that uh, haven't been identified with the transmission of information from uh, the website to individual insurers that has to do with, you know, getting uh, uh, the accurate information to those insurers so that they can uh, provide the, the coverage that individuals have signed up for. And that's, uh, you know, these specific identifiable problems are the things that the tech teams are working on and fixing through uh, writing code, adding capacitors, 
uh, capacity through additional servers and through a variety of other means. The work of you know constantly improving a website will continue, uh, you know, I think uh, day by day. So it's not. What I can tell you is that a week from now it's going to be better than it is today, and a week after that it's going to be much better than it is today, and that's going to continue and continue. So I don't know what endpoint an outside computer expert might be imagining. What we know is that today and every day, individuals are able to get important information from the website. They're able to enroll. Often, uh, they, individuals experience frustration and delays, uh, and that's unacceptable. We're working to fix that. But others are, are succeeding and enrolling through the website. Others are going through the different avenues that are available to them. And we're just going to keep breaking rocks on this okay. uh, until you know, we are satisfied that Americans are able to use that website at a level of functionality that uh, meets our expectations. Can I sure. ask about, so a lot of computer experts told us that just because of how much code they estimate that to be, and again, that's what we have to go on because we don't have mm -hmm. specifics, they actually say it would be easier to start from scratch, to scrap the whole thing and start over. Is that under consideration? Again, I think it's important to note that two things. One. Uh, we have tech teams working on specific fixes to the existing system. So our belief is that we, we, are, we are making uh, fixes to the uh, existing system. We're, we're dealing with the volume on the web track by, uh, on the website, uh, rather, the traffic, uh, by increasing our bandwidth uh, and improving site architecture. Uh, we're uh, substituting in hardware to make uh, changes that make it more optimized. And we're uh, improving database queries. We're you know, there were tests done. Uh, there are going to be more tests done uh, now that we know what we're dealing with in terms of volume. Uh, we're listening to consumer feedback and making changes that make the cons you know that respond to what the consumers are saying they want, uh, so that uh, you know existing features, for example, like the tax calculator or the uh, ability to just search uh, for general information about available plans, is more prominently featured so that. Uh, the consumer experience has improved, and we're just going to, you know, we're going to tackle this day by day. Uh, and uh, we have, you know, some extremely talented people working on this, and working with the existing team, and uh, at the direction of Secretary Sebelius and the President of the United States, uh, they're going to work tirelessly until the consumer experience on the website uh, matches uh, the President's expectations. Jim. As tempting as it is to ask you another question about health care, I'd like to change I, the subject you for a keep, Oh, OK. I was going to say you can keep at it. Um, on immigration, mm -hmm. what has the president done specifically, or the administration done specifically, to restart after the shutdown and now after a this Obamacare issue? Restart in the House uh, an immigration, comprehensive immigration reform bill. Uh, well, n noting, of course, that the shutdown ended about five minutes ago in Washington in the way it feels, really, but the uh, only a few days ago, uh, and that we averted you know economic shutdown globally only a few days ago. Uh, the fact of the matter is is that the minute that uh, totally manufactured crisis uh, was resolved, the president made clear in the remarks that he delivered that uh, he firmly believes we can get comprehensive immigration reform through Congress and on his desk by the end of the year. So the answer to your question is we've, we're, we're talking with uh, members and staff members uh, in Congress about how to move forward. I note that the Speaker of the House today uh, said that uh, he believes it's an important issue that uh, can be and should be addressed. And you know there are a variety of ways to do this. And obviously, the, the leaders of the House have to decide how they want to proceed. The Senate has passed a, a comprehensive bipartisan bill very significant achievement. And it doesn't uh, match word for word what the uh, President necessarily would have written, but it meets uh, the criteria that he set. And he would sign it if the House were to pass essentially the identical version. The way that it, as I understand it, needs to work is the House still has to produce its own bill or bills and that that would have to be conferenced. So we'll, we'll work with the House. We'll work with uh, every interested party uh, of both parties. Uh, or no party to, to try to move this forward. Because the point the President was making uh, when he identified immigration reform and uh, a budget deal and uh, the farm bill uh, as 
things that could get done at the end of the year. He was, he was isolating them because bipartisan work has been done already uh, on those uh, areas. And, uh, and that, of course, when it comes to the budget, there is a conference coming together, which is something that we had hoped and called for all year. Uh, he did not, although it was suggested in some places, and I'm looking at you, Peter, the, um, uh, somehow lower his ambitions. I mean, if, if anybody had said at the beginning of the year that if we had identified completion of comprehensive immigration reform as a goal to achieve at the end of the year, that that was somehow small potatoes, uh, you would have been laughed at. That's a big deal, and we think we can get it done. So uh, obviously it depends on the House acting. And we're going, sure, go ahead. On that part, there have been in the last couple of days <coughs> proposals made from the Republican side mm -hmm. which seem to include even a pathway to citizenship, perhaps a more difficult pathway. Mm -hmm. Has the White House reached out to those people across the aisle and I, begun to talk I don't, to them? I don't know them? about specific conversations related to specific uh, proposals. The President's interested in constructive proposals that, it, that, that would move us forward uh, and lead us to achieve uh, a comprehensive solution that meet his criteria, and a pathway to citizenship is one of them. It's a, the, the one that he envisioned and the one that the Senate passed is, is, uh, is, a, is a serious piece of business. It requires getting in the back of the line, paying, uh, you know, fines and past taxes, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a very responsible approach to uh, meeting that challenge, and it, and it increases significantly resources for border security. It, it uh, uh, you know, addresses the issue, uh, the profound issue that especially technology companies, but other companies have identified, American companies, and that is the need to retain uh, highly capable talent here in the United States, immigrant talent, people who come here to study at the best universities in the world and haven't always been able to stay, to start businesses or to go work with American businesses uh, because of our Im immigration laws. So uh, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of important work that was achieved in that comprehensive bill that passed the Senate that meets the President's criteria, and he believes that uh, he believes that there's a bipartisan majority in the House, and probably a significant one, uh, that would support that similar comprehensive approach. So we're going to work in every way we can to get that done. We believe uh, it's in the interest of the country, it's in the interest of the economy. I mean, it, it, you know, when we talk about ways that we can grow the economy and add jobs, it's past comprehensive, comprehensive immigration reform. I, I guess I'm sure. trying to get a little more pointed on this, is that there, because of what happened with the shutdown mm -hmm. and the fact that nobody trusts anymore anybody anymore across the aisle. Is the President going to do anything to try to bridge that trust again by talking to those on the Republican side? Yes. Here's, here's where I think it's important to remember. The experience we all enjoyed, uh, and I use that sarcastically, in the shutdown wasn't brought about by Republicans. In other words, it wasn't brought about by all Republicans. It wasn't supported by all Republicans. It was caused by a faction of the Republican Party in one house, uh, with some prominent help by supporters in the other house. There are plenty of Republican lawmakers who want to make progress on comprehensive immigration reform, and we've, we've had a lot of conversations and consultations with them at, at the presidential level. I mean, you know, Senators McCain and Graham have, have played enormously constructive roles in this process and will continue to do so. And, and there are members of the House Republican Conference who support that kind of bipartisan comprehensive approach. So this is not about, you know, mistrust between Democrats on the one side and Republicans on the other. I mean, a lot of these challenges have to do with uh, allowing the natural bipartisan coalitions that can be formed to form and uh, for those bipartisan coalitions uh, to vote on bipartisan solutions. If that happens, we can get uh, comprehensive immigration reform, we can get a farm bill, we can get uh, even a budget deal. So uh, those are uh, lofty goals, but, you know, they're achievable. Major. Uh, one bit of housekeeping. There are several health care CEOs here today to yes. meet with uh, White House officials. Will the President also meet with them? And can you tell us who they're meeting with and will you get, provide a list of all I, those who are let me Let me do that right now. I appreciate it. Uh, as you mentioned, se senior administration officials are, in fact, meeting today with health insurance industry CEOs at 2 p.m., uh, 15 minutes or so, uh, at the White House. Uh, the officials include Dennis McDonough, Valerie Jarrett, Secretary Sebelius, and Chris Jennings. Uh, the purpose of the meeting is to continue to discuss open enrollment and ongoing implementation of the Affordable Care Act. The CEOs bring an important on-the-ground perspective as we work to implement the law, and the group is expected to also discuss 
the ongoing efforts to fix the technical issues with healthcare.gov and continue to improve the consumer experience. I have a list of attendees. We can provide it to you, but they include the CEOs of Aetna, Humana, Care First, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Florida, HealthNet Inc., uh, Tufts Health Plan, Blue Cross Blue Shield. I'm sorry. Oh no, no, we can. I can read. You want me to read them all? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mark Bertolini, CEO of Aetna. Bruce Brassard, the CEO of Humana. Chet Burrell, CEO of Care First. Patrick Garrity, CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Florida. Jay Gellert. President and CEO of HealthNet Inc., Patricia Hemingway Hall, President and CEO, CEO of Healthcare Services Corporation, Daniel J. Hilferty, President and CEO, Independence Blue Cross, Karen Ignagi, Ignagni, I hope I pronounced that right, probably not, President and CEO, America's Health Insurance Plans, uh, Michael uh, uh, Niedorf, Chairman and CEO of Centene Corp., James Roosevelt, President and CEO, Tufts Health Plan, Scott Serrata, President and CEO, Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, uh, Joseph Swedish, CEO, WellPoint, and Bernard Tyson, CEO, Kaiser Permanente. And, and as I said at the top, the discussion will focus on implementation uh, and enrollment. It will focus on the efforts to fix the technical issues that uh, have been identified with healthcare.gov, and one of those issues has to do with uh, making sure that uh, insurers are getting uh, accurate information from uh, the virtual marketplace, from individuals, uh, so that they can then uh, provide them with the coverage that individuals are signing up uh, to get. So uh, obviously uh, these are very important uh, players in this process and, and Dennis and others look forward to the meeting. Do you anticipate the president? Uh, I, I, I don't have him as a participant in this, uh, so I, I, don't, I don't anticipate that, but you know, it's a small building. I want to pick up on something that was discussed here yesterday and maybe get a little bit more specific. Mm -hmm. On the new feature, that has been added to the website where if you put in your zip code, you get an estimate of mm -hmm. your cost. As we understand it, if you are 50 and older, you get an estimate for someone who's 50 years old. And if you're 49 and younger, those are the two categories broadly on the federal website, you get an estimate for someone who's 27 years old. If you go deeper in the process, you can often find from that estimate a much larger actual premium cost because you could be older and mm -hmm. older people require higher premiums. Is that something that you're going to keep? Or do you find that there's anything that's deceptive or less than clear or candid in that consumer experience that you're trying to provide? A, a, a great question. And let me make clear two things. One, these are estimates. And uh, we're just trying to provide uh, basic information in an easily accessible way. Uh, the idea that we're trying to mislead people about costs is belied entirely by the irrefutable fact that premiums were published and provided to the public prior to October 1st. And those premiums for these plans uh, were published without subsidies attached to them. So in other words, they seemed uh, ex much more expensive for most individuals than the cost would actually be. So, uh, but in terms of making improvements to the website, you know, moving this feature in into a place so that it was more accessible for average users so they could window shop uh, was a change they'd made. I, you know, and specifically, I don't know what other changes they may make, but I'm sure they're going to continue to try to make the user experience uh, better. One thing that's important to note is that in terms of the volume we've seen, uh, the volume, because there have been some assertions that have to, you know, that this, that this making this feature available has, uh, has affected or had something to do with uh, the technological problems that have existed. The volume we've seen that began on October 1st uh, was roughly 30 uh, percent browsers and 70 percent potential enrollees or applicants. Since this feature was added, that percentage breakdown has not changed. Has not changed. The reason I ask is some of the statewide exchanges don't have a zip code at the front end. They have an age at the front end. Mm -hmm. So you get a much more direct and more rapid mm -hmm. explanation on their websites of the premiums that you're actually going to pay as opposed to an estimate. And so I'm just saying that's a, a practical comparison application that you could on the federal website look at and incorporate. Well, look, again, I think that you're going to a, an issue that's important and that is, that's about, you know, consumer that consumer feedback and what's useful, but the the underlying you know, assumption here is that uh, we'd be hiding the ball when in fact the premiums were published and have been public and they've been available information forever. A and B, Which if you want specific the average consumer is not necessarily going to be familiar with that database or access it and that this is one of their first 
experience is with trying to figure right. out and if, cost. And, if, and what's been true from day one is that you could go on the site, enter in specific information about your age, where you live and that sort of stuff, and get much more specific uh, estimates about what your premiums would be. So that has always been available. Our interest is in providing as much information as, as, as possible to consumers about their choices. And the bottom line, as was evident prior to October 1st, and it's true today and will be true throughout the enrollment period, is that, uh, you know, what is it, six out of ten uh, individuals who purchase insurance through the marketplaces are going to pay on average under $100 a month in premium. So, uh, you know, our interest is in making people aware of uh, what's available to them and giving them as much information about the options available to them as possible. And as we find ways to improve the consumer experience, we're going to make those improvements. This is related to what Brianna asked about. Mm -hmm. uh, and with your indulgence, let me just read something that was in the New Yorker yesterday. Because it quotes a guy named Fred Brooks, who's written a very well-received book about software project management. And he has something that's called the Brooks Law, which goes as follows. Adding manpower to a software project late makes it late. He goes on to say, this is taken as gospel by programmers because it's usually true. It takes so much time for new coders to comprehend the system that they're supposed to be fixing that typically it would have been faster not to include them at all. In this case, though, the writer says, there may be some chance that a tech surge will work. The project is already made of discrete par parts that could be improved by many teams working in parallel. I'm wondering if, based on what you know and what you've been briefed on internally, mm -hmm. you think this latter scenario is possible, and if so, if you could explain why. Well, I think it's, it's possible, possible and it's actually a, an excellent shorthand description of what's happening, which is that there are many uh, areas of the website that uh, can be addressed in a focused way by teams that look at uh, the uh, problems that have arisen and been exposed uh, by uh, you know, the launch and the, and the volume that occurred in the, after the launch. Uh, and they've isolated those problems, and they're isolating those problems, and they address them uh, when it has to do with capacity by adding capacity, when it has to do with code by writing new code, uh, you know, optimizing the interface for users uh, where that helps, uh, and, you know, consulting technology specialists uh, operating state-based exchanges, which, as many of you have noted, uh, have been working, at least in many cases, effectively, obviously on a smaller scale, but to share best practices and incorporate them. Uh, you know, it's important to note that what we've done here is uh, bring in some fresh eyes and brains uh, and, ha and have them uh, attach them to existing teams. We're not, we're not starting fresh, you know, and asking people to suddenly learn the system uh, having, you know, lost the expertise that uh, existed as the system was built. Uh, these are new eyes and, uh, and tech experts who are being brought in to uh, uh, add, add capacity, brain capacity, and, and, and a fresh look uh, as we address these problems. And the specifics you mentioned there, will they be part of the briefings that will commence tomorrow at CMS? Because uh, obviously you know all of us here are very hungry for mm -hmm. assessments, specific interventions you're doing, things you're seeing, how you're rewriting the code, or how you're dealing with capacity. Will we finally get to the point tomorrow at these briefings where we can actually hear and see and tangibly report on these developments? Uh, the answer is that's the idea. We're going to, you know, we're setting up a process where there'll be regular briefings at Secretary Sebelius's uh, instigation that would uh, try to uh, answer your questions and provide as much information as possible about, you know, this ongoing work. And it's, it's very technical. It's very uh, uh, process oriented. Uh, and uh, we, it's, I think, important that it's housed over there because that's closer to the ground. That's where this is happening. CMS obviously oversees this process and the affordable and the uh, Department of Health and Human Services uh, oversees CMS. So uh, that's the idea, that we're going to try to provide as much information as we can. I can promise you that uh, every question that you have, uh, you know, won't be, uh, we won't be able to answer or they won't be able to answer uh, right away. They may have to go back and get more information, but there's going to be uh, an effort here to uh, to give you a sense of uh, what's happening and how we're addressing these challenges. Ed. I want to talk health care about a couple of foreign mm -hmm. policy issues first. Um, there were reports out of Germany this morning that the German government believes um, that as part of the NSA surveillance, the U.S. government was monitoring Chancellor Merkel's cell phone. Can you confirm or deny that? Uh, I can tell you that today President Obama and Chancellor Merkel spoke by telephone. 
regarding the allegations that you mentioned, uh, that the U.S. National Security Agency intercepted the communications of the German Chancellor, and I can tell you that the President assured the Chancellor that the United States is not monitoring and will not monitor the communications of the Chancellor. The United States greatly values our close cooperation with Germany on a broad range of shared security challenges. As the President has said, the U.S. is reviewing the way that we gather intelligence to ensure that we properly balance the security concerns of our citizens and allies with the privacy concerns that all people share. Both leaders agreed to intensify further the cooperation between our intelligence services with the goal of protecting the security of both countries and of our partners, as well as protecting the privacy of our citizens. Thank you. And when you say, pardon me, not monitoring, does that leave the door open to the possibility the NSA as part of a broader sweep, picked mm -hmm. up some of our communications but was not, quote unquote, you know, all, all I can tell you is what the President told the Chancellor. The United States is not monitoring and will not monitor the communications of the Chancellor. Uh, you know, as we've said in the past, uh, you know, we gather foreign intelligence just like agencies, uh, similar agencies uh, of other countries. Uh, uh, but we are working to, uh, as the President has said, uh, to review the way that we gather intelligence to ensure that we properly balance both the security concerns of our citizens and allies uh, with the privacy concerns uh, that everyone shares. Uh, President, this afternoon meeting with the Pakistani Prime Minister, obviously a lot on the agenda. One issue, though, that has come up in the last couple of years is this Pakistani doctor who was put in prison because he helped the U.S. government find bin Laden, which obviously the U.S. government felt was very valuable. Is, is that something the President is still pushing on? Is that something he would raise? Absolutely. And I can tell you that our position on Dr. Afridi has long been clear. And I'm sure we will again make it clear during this visit. We believe his treatment is both unjust and unwarranted. He should be released. Bringing Osama bin Laden to justice was clearly in Pakistan's interests. And the prosecution and conviction of Dr. Afridi sends exactly the wrong message about the importance of this shared interest. Uh, so this is something that we have, uh, in a sustained way, made clear to uh, Pakistan and will continue to, including during this visit. Uh, a couple quick points on health care. Um, when uh, Jim asked you at the beginning about what Secretary Sibelius has told CNN about the President not being told before October 1st, mm -hmm. you seem to confirm that timeline. Uh, I wonder, um, why wasn't the President told, though? This yeah, is his I, signature I, I, achievement. Sure. Uh, was he being insulated from, from the potential mm -hmm. damage? Why wasn't he told? Sure, I, it's very similar to Jim's question. What the President made clear, and they, he's on the record saying this, I think, you know, well ahead of the launch, is that we expected hiccups and glitches, as you would expect from the launch of any major complex website. Uh, that's what we expected. That's what uh, I think the teams expected. Uh, and we did not expect or anticipate the, s uh, the scale of the problems that, w uh, have uh, that has occurred. And that's uh, you know, that's on us. And there's no question that testing was done and testing should have been uh, more thorough and therefore we would have been uh, more prepared for this, uh, well, this kind of challenge. The stress test that the Washington Post reported on yesterday where hundreds were simultaneously getting on the site and it, it crashed, mm -hmm. was that not passed on to the President? And if not, why not? Ed, I think that what we said is that there were tests done uh, and that uh, while there was expect, exp an expectation that there would be problems and glitches, that they would not be uh, of the significance and scale that we've seen, uh, and that they would be uh, uh, ones that could be uh, dealt with. Uh, and uh, while the site was uh, operating and operating relatively smoothly, again, with the understanding that the launch of any website of this complexity would have some initial problems. So the answer is, I think the, the fundamental answer to these questions is, it's absolutely correct that the website uh, from October 1st has not and did not operate uh, as smoothly uh, or even close to as smoothly as we anticipated uh, based on the information that we had. And that includes the, the, you know, the people working on the site itself. And uh, you know, we're responsible for that, and that's why the President and the Secretary have directed uh, this uh, significant around-the-clock effort uh, to systematically make changes and adjustments and fixes to the website to improve the user experience. What is true is that every day, including the first day, Americans from across the country and the states that utilize the federal exchanges uh, have been getting information they need, signing up, uh, and enrolling. And our goal is to just make that process easier every day uh, and to make it easier 
uh, on the website and to make it easier by making sure that Americans know that there are three other avenues uh, through which they can achieve the same goal. The very last one, the President has said in many public forums that he would be willing to make reasonable changes to his health care law if Republicans mm -hmm. present them. Republican Marco Rubio has presented a bill that would basically say delay any IRS penalties mm -hmm. Uh, until people can fully enroll, until we know the website is fully operational. Meanwhile, a Democrat, Jean Shaheen, wrote a letter, as I understand it, to the President yesterday saying she'd like to see the enrollment deadline in March extended further so that people have more time. Are these reasonable approaches that the President is going to look at and might even support? I can, well, they, they address slightly different issues. The, the fact is we're in, uh, on the third week and second day of a six-month process. And from day one, people have been able to get information and enroll. The process through the website has been unacceptably complicated and difficult, and we're working to fix that every day. Uh, but uh, meanwhile, people are getting the information they need, and they are shopping, and they are uh, signing up, and they are enrolling. Uh, two, when it comes to the uh, individual mandate, uh, I think I'll say two things about proposals from Republicans who have said it as, a, as their mission to eliminate, decimate, sabotage Obamacare from the beginning, who were willing with great glee to shut the government down because of their opposition to Obamacare, uh, we have to take their proposals with a grain of salt. Uh, I don't think they're filled with sincerity about a, uh, a sincere desire to improve the system. Uh, they have made clear that their goal is to uh, eliminate the system and thereby eliminate the possibility for millions of Americans with pre-existing conditions or millions of Americans who don't have insurance. Uh, possibility of getting it. So that's one. Two, uh, when it comes to, and we, we talked about this when they were shutting down the government over our, the President's refusal to uh, pay a ransom, uh, an Obamacare ransom in exchange for keeping the government open or in exchange for raising the debt ceiling. You know, we talked about delaying the, the so-called individual mandate. Well, what does that mean concretely? That means that if you're that single mom uh, who's a breast cancer survivor who uh, has been anticipating the day that she would be able to get affordable health insurance, uh, which would give her the security of knowing that she would have the care she needed to stay alive for her family, you're telling them, wait another year. And wait another year because the people behind the proposal actually want to make you wait forever. Uh, that's not acceptable. It's not going to happen. Peter. Very simply, can you tell us how many people have been enrolled for private insurance through the health care law? Uh, as I said, Peter, I think on numerous occasions we will be providing that information monthly, as uh, is the case with similar systems. Do you know how many people have been enrolled? Again, I would tell you that we will uh, provide that information monthly. What, uh, you know, you're talking about, because again, it's when it's... Because Kathleen Sebelius yesterday said that the number is in the thousands. The President said the number is in the thousands. I guess I'm trying to confirm that you guys actually know what the number is and have just actively chosen not to communicate it to the The number American is in the public. thousands. Uh, you know, I think the point is, and I think so that the know. Secretary said this, is that, uh, you know, we're ga we, we want to make sure the information is correct. We want to do it on a regularized basis. We're, you know, we're talking about people who are signing up through state exchanges, who are signing up uh, in person, who are signing up by mail, who are signing up over the phone and signing up on healthcare.gov. Uh, so uh, it makes all the sense in the world uh, to regularize the release of that information in the way that it's been done with previous similar programs. So. Uh, that's what we're going to do. We've talked about this tech surge. How much will Can I just say that on that point? Uh, we have made clear from the beginning, including before uh, we've uh, encountered the problems that we've seen on uh, the website, that uh, it is, has been our expectation, uh, because this has been the case in Massachusetts and it's been the case with other programs, that uh, when there is an open enrollment period, uh, people tend to, sh the, the, the disproportionate number of people who uh, demonstrate an interest in the product shop and don't buy uh, in mass until the end. That was the case in Massachusetts. That was the case uh, with a variety of other programs, including federal programs. So that's always been our expectation, uh, that the majority of people would be uh, enrolling uh, closer to the deadline. One of the reasons why we had this uh, six-month period is to provide a lot of time for people to shop and, and look at their options, because this is a new, it's a new deal for people, and it's a special and important deal for people. A couple questions quickly, if I can. First of all, how much money uh, is this tech surge costing us, or should we anticipate the tech surge will cost us? Uh, what I can tell you is that uh, some members of the so-called tech surge are presidential innovation fellows. They're paid already, uh, and they're simply been, they've been assigned uh, specifically to this task. Uh, there are others who are already government employees uh, who are being assigned to the task, and then there are those who are coming from the private sector, and they're being 
uh, uh, hired by contractors under existing contracts. Yeah, then I want to, finally, if I can quickly, we've spoken to a number of health care providers, mm -hmm. insurers like the visitors that are going to be here at the White House today. They're reporting a number like 10 to 20 insurance enrollments a day. One of them told us that there was a 50% error rate, which means the data they're receiving, not the registration process, the data they're receiving is wrong half the time. And that that information doesn't just come through the website, it comes through the computer system in general. So when you call in mm -hmm. or you do it in person, that same transmission system provides the language refers to what's called an 834, but a data mm -hmm. transmission sheet with information that is wrong. So given that, is it unfair to tell Americans right now to keep trying if so much of the information that's pro being provided the insurance companies is presently wrong? Well, the percentage uh, error rate is not, I don't know, but I can tell you, and I mentioned this at the top, that one of the problems that has been identified and that is being worked on uh, is that uh, stage towards the end when information is provided to insurers, uh, and 834, I believe, is what, uh, how it's identified. The, and that's something that I expect will be discussed uh, with the CEOs of insurers today. Uh, and we are, there, the tech team is working specifically on this challenge. Now, it's a fair question. Should Americans who know that there are errors in the transmission of this information be frustrated? Yes. Uh, should they therefore decide not to buy insurance? I think the answer is no. Because the people who, remember, 80 to 85 percent of us uh, already have insurance through our employer or through Medicare or Medicaid, uh, it's those other millions of Americans for whom these marketplaces have been built and for whom the security of having affordable health insurance uh, is, uh, you know, something extremely valuable. And uh, our goal is to make uh, purchasing that insurance as easy as possible. And we uh, are ex enormously frustrated that uh, we haven't succeeded thus far in making it as easy as possible through the website. And we're going to work every day to make it as easy as possible. But the, the point is to provide the insurance that the Americans uh, who have shown interest in it want so desperately, and that's what we're going to focus on. So the answer is yes. For those people who are frustrated, uh, we're, to tell them we're working on the challenges here with the website, but uh, what we're doing is not just fixing a website. We're making sure that they have insurance. Yeah, yeah. I just want to say, guys, for the everybody in back, I think we did about 45 minutes on the front row. So, um, which is why I, which is why I mix it up sometimes. But I just want to get. I'm, I'm doing it, April. I'm here. Yes, sir. Uh, following up on what you said earlier about a code of conduct for people with white I, I just mean generally. I, 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 again, I'm not going to talk about the specific case. I don't know. I have, I know not, I know, I have no details about it. I, the, the individual doesn't work here, and I would refer you to him. assume that tweets by people with approved accounts amount to statements on behalf of the White House and the administration? There's language attached to those accounts that uh, says whatever it says in legalese. So, uh, and I think those are archived just like every email. Uh, that's for example, sent. would it be proper for someone with an approved White House account to retweet uh, a, an item from a satirical publication that makes fun of the president's uh, opponents? Uh, you know, it depends. Again, I think it depends on the context. I can, if you want to uh, show me an example of it, like, I, I can tell you that. Uh, you know, as a spokesman, as somebody who's out on the record every day, you know, there are things that I say I wish I could have back. I'm sure that's true when I speak officially of almost everybody. Uh, I, you know, I, there are things I say speaking officially that sometimes I wish I could have them back. They're not said eloquently or grammatically or maybe, uh, you know, the tone isn't right. Uh, and I think every spokesperson around the administration and on Capitol Hill would probably agree with me on that. But that, that's, that's different. When you're speaking as an official, obviously, you have responsibilities. Your, your counterpart at the State Department said it is not correct that uh, this person uh, worked for the State Department. Uh, I'll have to take the question then. He I says at one point he had been a State Department employee detailed to the White House, but at some point this summer he was made a National Security Staff employee, and that's why they're handling the questions about the personnel matter there. Okay, and Peter, I, 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 I think I've said I, I don't know a lot about this. I'll, I'll, I'll get what information we can provide. In general, we don't. Would you discuss personnel you, uh, matters. Would you post a clarification? If, I, I will uh, Ms. find out what right? I will find out what information I can. I'm glad this is of such intense interest, Margaret. Uh, thanks. I have a health care question, but if there's time, maybe you come back to me or I'll follow up by email. I'd like to yield my question to one of the visiting Pakistani journalists. Absolutely. Uh, please go ahead, sir. 
and identify yourself. My yeah. name is Naveed. I'm from business, Daily Business Recorder, Islamabad. My first question is, the peace accord in Afghanistan and Pakistan depend on opening talks with the Taliban. Are, are both countries facilitated by the United States, yet uh, no such talks have, have begun and there is no certainty that they will. What happens after 2014 if no such talks have succeeded? Uh, you're talking about reconciliation talks between uh, the Afghan government and the Taliban? Yes. Well, we absolutely believe that ultimate peace and security in Afghanistan depends on uh, reconciliation, and we have uh, played a role in trying to facilitate that process. Uh, but it is a process that involves the two parties uh, directly, and uh, we're going to continue to work on that with uh, our partners uh, in Kabul. Uh, it's an important challenge because ultimately uh, this needs to be resolved in that way. Uh, so. I think the separate issue when you talk about 2014 has to do with uh, our ongoing uh, consultations and uh, with the, the Afghan government about the bilateral security agreement. There was a significant uh, progress made recently in those talks when Secretary Kerry was there, uh, and uh, I'm sure we'll have more information for you on that, as well as uh, you know our uh, decisions about uh, continued support for uh, Afghanistan uh, in the aftermath of 2014. Mara. I'm oh, oh, sorry. You? Uh, is, is the United States prepared to provide civil nuclear technology to help Pakistan overcome its energy crisis along the same lines as the U.S. India civil nuclear accord? I'll have to take the question. I don't. I don't have an answer to that. Margaret. Yes, Margaret. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to clarify with the CEOs: is is what the president is trying to do uh, through Dennis and Valerie, if he doesn't pop in himself? to assure them that this isn't going to fall apart and that the, the, finan the financing of the expansion will make sense? Or is he soliciting help from them in trying to figure out how to improve the website? Basically, I know they're going to talk about the problems and try to move forward, but kind of how? What's the focus? Well, first of all, the, the, the technological work, the technical work is being done by the teams who are working on the website. I think the insurance companies themselves, and I would obviously point you to what they've said and what uh, their positions are, uh, have a great interest in the Affordable Care Act uh, working effectively and that the, uh, and by working effectively, therefore, uh, increasing the number of insured Americans uh, in the private insurance market. Uh, so uh, it's obviously uh, an issue of great interest to them and, and one that we have consulted with them regularly on since uh, the Affordable Care Act was being drafted. Uh, so this is a part of that process and I think, again, this is, I identified the senior officials who are in the meeting. Uh, uh, the President's not scheduled to attend, but certainly the Chief of Staff, the Secretary is, uh, and it's uh, something we view as uh, an important part of this process. Mara. I have a question on immigration, just to follow up on Jim's question. You mentioned uh, Senators McCain and Graham, but since the action on immigration or the inaction is in the House, does he have plans or has he talked to House Republicans about this, or is this the kind of issue that his direct involvement at this point would be counterproductive? Well, that last question is always an interesting one and sometimes probably best addressed to Republicans who sometimes feel that anything associated with him is not something they could support. So, uh, but it gets at a bigger problem. Having said that, the wisdom and the benefits of comprehensive immigration reform, we believe, supersede these kind of uh, partisan differences. The, uh, uh, even in crass political terms, I think it's fair to say uh, that it is in the interests of the Republican Party to address this problem. They've said so themselves. You know, key members of the party, key leaders and spokesmen, the, sec uh, the Speaker of the House today said it's an important issue and we should address it. I think uh, Chairman Ryan has said that and others in the House. So, uh, but their politics is something obviously they have to take care of uh, and make judgments about themselves. What we know is that uh, there is just an overwhelming abundance of uh, information that argues in favor of passing comprehensive immigra immigration reform. In other words, that if you were if you want if you were a Republican who wanted to argue why uh, you're going to vote yes for something like this, uh, there's just a lot there for you when it comes to uh, economic uh, growth and job creation. When it comes to fairness for middle class Americans and accountability for all American business. When it comes to uh, dramatically increased resources for border security to build on 
uh, the uh, substantial improvements in border security that we've already seen in the last five years. So uh, we believe that there, there are conservative reasons to do this and uh, that there has been broad bipartisan support and uh, will continue to be and we hope the House takes action. But there, has the President talked to, had private direct talks with the House President has or had, does he have plans to do so? I get, Mara, I, I get that like everything is always reduced to whether or not the President of the United States is on the phone with or in speaking with uh, the Speaker of the House. That's not how this will, or, or the Chairman or whoever. I think that's a, a, a narrow view about how this can come about. The answer is he will, he has, uh, and he is having conversations with Republicans about comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, but if that's all it took, we would have gotten there already because he's, we've had uh, many conversations with supporters of it, many conversations with those who are on the fence about it. Uh, ultimately, obviously, the House has to act and we hope they will. Uh, Jackie. Uh, just to follow up on that, the, uh, in terms of the President talking to Republicans and the efficacy of that, can you um, <laughs> rule out what there was a, um, uh, the number two Senate Democrat, uh, Dick Durbin, said on his Facebook page that uh, someone in recent um, exchange with the President said he can't even stand, this member of Congress said he can't even stand to look at the President. Can you say whether that happened? Or you I, I looked into this and, and spoke with somebody who was in that meeting, and it did not happen. Did you anyone speak from the White House speak to Senator Durbin about it? I, I don't know. I don't. Uh, my understanding is that, uh, again, from participant in the meeting, that that didn't happen. Did anything like it happen? That would not that I'm aware of, Jackie. Um, and you said you don't want to talk about personnel matters when it comes to uh, NETSEC, uh, Wonk, and the firing. But uh, most of the tweets that have been reported are really not very substantive. They're rather sophomoric mm -hmm. and take shots at people on really personal levels about their appearance and such, a lot of that. Are there emails that the White House saw that were substantive, that you know divulged or gave out information? I mean, this is a person who got fired after all. Jackie, I, I understand. I would address your questions to the individual. He doesn't work here uh, and anymore, and I uh, just don't have in more information for you on that personnel matter. Yeah there was anything of a sort of national security. I just uh, don't have any information on that to provide. Okay. Carrie, and then April. Um, in the upcoming budget talks, is the White House still adhering to the principle that any, actually, just in terms of the sequester, any attempt to buy down the sequester over the next few years, that if there are attempts to buy it down, that it's equally divided between cuts and revenue? Is that a principle the White House is adhering to in those talks? Our approach has always been that when it comes to a broader budget deal, we need to apply balance, that uh, reducing the deficit further, building on the progress that's been made that's allowed us to cut the deficit in half since the President took office, requires a balanced approach. And, you know, there has always been for a number of years now talk of a grand bargain of 10-year deals, smaller deals, and so uh, I, it's hard for me to negotiate from here speculatively about what a smaller deal would look like. But balance is a fundamental principle that this President has uh, not only espoused but put on paper in detailed proposals. Uh, so we believe it has long been in the interest of both parties to uh, deal with the arbitrary cuts that the sequester represents. It's done, uh, it's done harm, as Jason Furman mentioned yesterday. According to CBO, an average of 60,000 jobs that have not been created because of per month because of the sequester. Uh, certainly, something we're interested in addressing. The president's budget uh, eliminated the sequester and then reduced the deficit beyond what the sequester reduces it. So, uh, by addressing our budget challenges in a very focused way, making and increasing investments in key areas while uh, eliminating or reducing programs that aren't working effectively or don't work at all. So, uh, and approaching the uh, issue of deficit reduction in a balanced way. So, I mean, that's a broad way of saying that's the principle and the approach that we take into it. Uh, we're hopeful that the conference uh, makes progress as they uh, try to reconcile the Senate and House budgets. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're interested in, as the President made clear, uh, a budget deal that moves this country forward, that helps it create jobs, helps it grow faster. I mean, those are the priorities we're focused on. Uh, we have been focused on deficit reduction, and we've made a lot of progress in deficit reduction. There's more to do, but we have to do it in a balanced way. Again, I think it, uh, 
when you talk about a, a, a broad deal, the, the nature of which that, again, but I'm not going to negotiate like hypothetical smaller deals. What I can tell you is that a broad, a broad, uh, larger budget agreement, uh, the kind envisioned by the president and his budget, would have to be balanced. Yes. Uh, April. Three yeah. questions. Um, and then the Voice of America. And then Tommy. Okay. Three questions, Jay. On three uh, questions. Go. On Peter, on, on, on Peter's uh, question, is there on the track? I have to fly out of here in a few minutes. I got a parent teacher conference, but go ahead. Go. I'm, I'm not going to, you get your questions. All right. Yes, today. All right. Um, oh. <laughs> anyway, moving on. On ACA, on the tracking issue, is there an integrated approach at all? on tracking uh, with states and insurance companies right now to track how many people have enrolled at this point? Uh, look, I think that well, we're gathering information. Uh, we're going to release uh, specific information about enrollment figures on a monthly basis beginning in November, you know, look back to October. Uh, and I just, I just don't, I, I don't have specific information to provide to you about that. We're, we're going to do this in the way that it's been traditionally done with similar programs. Uh, what I can tell you, as I mentioned to Peter, is that we have always, even predating the, the problems with the website, uh, anticipated that uh, in keeping with what we've seen in other programs of similar nature, uh, that, and even in keeping with open enrollment periods that you see in, uh, you know, insurance plans that you guys probably sign up for every year, uh, a lot of people do a lot of their enrolling uh, at the very end while they shop earlier. So that's, uh, that's the, the kind of thing we expect to see. Uh, but we will be providing information monthly. On the speaker Twitter handle scandal, um, <laughs> no, seriously, has the, has the White House in any way changed guidelines for staffers or for administration officials and how it relates with social media now? Because many people have their yeah. own uh, social media on their own privately, sure. and then they have the government one. I haven't, I, I, I have not seen anything new on that. Going to be a revamping of gun control uh, from the president anytime soon, since the shutdown is over um, and things are coming back. The I appreciate stopped. the question. Look, this is a this is a uh, an issue that the president believes we can and should make progress on in a bipartisan way uh, that achieves uh, some comprehensive or not comprehensive some common sense uh, steps towards reducing gun violence that. Uh, do not in any way infringe upon our Second Amendment rights, which the President supports. Uh, so he's always looking at ways, uh, either through Congress or, or uh, through his executive authority, to uh, chip away at this program. So, uh, you know, I don't have anything to announce, but it certainly is something that he's focused on. Uh, April, is that your third? I got I can. I'm done. I'm done. Tommy and the VOA, and, this, and then I got to run. Thanks, Jay. I just have two. Um, my first question is, uh, about uh, a week and a half ago, there was a protest uh, out in front of the White House here uh, at which a Confederate flag was flown. Uh, and then in the last couple of days, uh, Congressman Alan Grayson sent out a fundraiser where he, uh, there was a photo of a burning cross and he compared the Tea Party with, uh, with the Klan. I'm wondering if the President uh, is aware of either of these incidents and if he had a reaction. Uh, I haven't spoken to the President about them and I don't have a reaction. And, uh, my second question. Um, this morning on CNN, uh, Carol Costello said that uh, during while she was reporting on the presidential race, her comment was, uh, President Obama's people can be quite nasty. They don't like you to say anything bad about their boss, and they're not afraid to use whatever means they have at hand to stop you from doing that, including threatening your job. Uh, to your knowledge? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't even know. I'll, who said that? Carol Costello. Uh, yeah. Anyone here threaten her job? Or? <laughs> not that I'm aware of or have ever heard of. Uh, yes, sir. I don't think you're going to be able to do this justice in a few minutes, but on Iran, hmm. it seems to be a, you know, a, still a huge space between what the Secretary of State said today about an undeniably clear guarantee from Iran about peaceful purposes and what Netanyahu is saying about the need to remove centrifuges, to get rid of plutonium capability, um, and to remove the, what, what Israel calls, he calls the military nuclear program. Can you talk a little bit about what, what, what the hopes are for bridging that kind of a difference between the U.S. Well, look, and we work very closely with uh, our uh, Israeli counterparts in assessing the Iranian program and in, uh, you know, judging uh, where they are and what steps need to be made to assure the international community that uh, they have given up their nuclear weapons ambitions. And I think it's uh, two things are indisputable. One is we are where we are with the potential for progress in this area through diplomacy because of the comprehensive set of sanctions that was engineered by the United States and our partners. Uh, 
uh, and that has put enormous pressure on Iran. What is also true is that uh, we will not provide relief for sanctions until we see, uh, you know, concrete, transparent steps uh, by Iran towards uh, reaching that point where they can verifiably demonstrate to the world that they are not pursuing a nuclear weapon. So I think, you know, it is, our, it is the President's stated policy that we will not uh, accept Iran with a nuclear weapon. Uh, and that's a position, obviously, we share with uh, many countries. Thanks. Thanks.